uh, I'm going to show what's going on in our studio right now. We're, we're called Terraform. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. We're a 501c3. So we convinced the IRS that what we do is, is not exactly architecture for making money, but architecture for philanthropic reasons, uh, for humanitarian reasons. So I'm going to unpack a little bit of some of the work that uh, I do there and that I do with uh, some of my partners. Uh, Makoto is over here right now, uh, the genius. Uh, okay, so I understand I have 15 minutes, so I'm going to be uh, rather brief. Uh, we're gonna, today I'm going to discuss uh, three things, the city, ecology, and mobility. Uh, and exactly how do you combine all of these things into one single profession? And what is the reification of those ideas? So way back, this is 1908, we can see here, uh, oh, this is uh, Harry Pettit uh, in King's Dream of New York. And here he was thinking of these fantasies of uh, New York City, a New York City that was hyper-connected, connected via dirigibles in the sky, uh, bridges through skyscrapers, this cannonaded walkway system with all sorts of levels of transportation, slow-mo, fast-moving pedestrians, horses, etc. Uh, so it's not new. And in fact, there's an entire history of this kind of thinking. Uh, some of us call it uh, futurists, uh, imagineers. Uh, what we do is along those lines. We've actually come up with a name for it, or as a discipline. Uh, it does fit roughly within the realm of architecture, but it takes on some other notions as well. Uh, another big influential project is uh, Motopia by Jellico, a landscape architect, and Gordon Cullen, an urban designer that was working with him. Here, reverses the figure ground of the city. So the city itself, uh, what used to be roads, is now uh, buildings. And where there used to be buildings is uh, green space. In this case, and this is kind of important, it's essentially a recreational uh, green space, or just open space for the yeah, sake of open space. Uh, later on, we take the same notion, we make it productive. Uh, you can see that Jellicoe's idea is that cars and fast-moving transit happens above uh, 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 this, this particular city, and the people dwell underneath. It's a bit cruel. I think I would really want to account for light and air and orientation and not give it over to the uh, automobile. So th this is the field. Uh, this was part of uh, my work at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where I was with a, a group of fantastic researchers uh, under uh, William J. Mitchell, where we were charged with, uh, well, more or less, designing the Frank Gehry car which uh, that changed after you know three or four years. Uh, and we thought, well, actually, it's more than just the car. We thought we rethought everything from the wheel, which had some degree of success, to uh, how the city is influenced by the vehicle. And maybe the vehicle should be designed around the city, a much more important question. So here's a lot of the actors and agents that, uh, again, this is cut off, that normally operate when thinking about cities and mobility. So here, you, you, know, you have urban designers and architects, you have uh, engineers, te technologists, car designers, road ecology, which is a subfield of ecology, uh, 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 service consultation for energy, energy flows and energy systems, which is important, and logistics and planning. So the, the question was really, uh, you know, if a planner is going to put a train, and I know that there are many planners in the room, uh, and, and get it to run on time and deal with a certain population, uh, does he have or she? have permission to change the dimensions of the train, change the material of the chain, train, uh, just change the train in and of itself, make it a, you know, a, maybe a mothership with little teeny baby trains that come out and deal with the downtown core. Uh, you know, and, and architects, uh, the same thing. Architects don't design cars. They don't do what planners do. They don't deal directly with the object of the train. Uh, but they certainly design the buildings that these things negotiate. Uh, and, and car designers, uh, as probably another field, uh, or automotive engineers or transportation engineers, design those trains and cars, but they don't make skyscrapers or design skyscrapers, and they don't usually uh, deal with the logistics of planning for these things. So we thought that uh, uh, what if we put on a singular hat that included all of those professions, and this has been around for some time. And what would we call it? And what are some uh, primary principles that we could say about such a new field? Uh, well, one of them was, let's get smart. Right? Uh, a, a lot of the issues that are dealt with in transportation, uh, urban design, and architecture, and, and, and planning, it, it, is that uh, you have things like circuity. That's you know what's going on outside right now. Cars not knowing where they're going, uh, looking for parking, stuck in traffic, uh, not getting to the place where they need to be. This uses 
approximately 60% of the entire energy usage in the United States, and that's projected by 2050. So if cars were smarter, uh, how would that change the equation in how they operate the city? So we have this uh, bromide uh, here, form follows frequency. The car is connected and networked and intelligent. We put all of this in the wheel, right? Uh, so this is really, it's a car, but the entire car is happening in the wheel. Drive, train, suspension, motoring. And it's very intelligent, it's linked to all the other wheels on a municipal grid. And the skin and the envelope becomes a place for the passengers, right? Uh, and not only would the skin be responsive, but so could the veneer of the city. So the city itself would also be an informatic. So these are you know, these fantasies of flow. Uh, and, and how these vehicles move is also an interesting issue. They now, congestion is not done away with. Instead, it becomes a desire. It becomes gentle congestion, right? The, the trick is you move in flocks or herds or parliaments, and you're all connected via the network or the net wheel. And here's a, one of the early sketches of something like this happening. And here is a, a, a reification of that in the form of this omnidirectional vehicle. Uh, one of our designs for this soft, soft, soft car, uh, unlike that car, uh, that moves in flocks and herds, is, is, is meant to you whistle and it comes like Roy Rogers and his horse trigger. Right? Uh, you use it for an extended amount of time in the city, it has a certain range, and then you, when you want to leave it, you do. And it goes back into its stack recharges via induction uh, using renewable energies, and you get into the next car when you're done with whatever you need to, to do. Um, and how, how does this affect the city itself? So here's your typical city with command lines, signals, gradient curve changes, etc. Uh, and then the future city, which is an uh, interconnected network city, where there's this universal plinth of vehicles talking to one another and watching out for the pedestrians. The idea is to share the street with the pedestrians. So I'm sure some clever people are thinking, well, how do I share a, a, a street with a car, especially if I'm walking? Well, you do things like, say, the car can't go faster than 30 miles an hour, that every single part of that vehicle is uh, uh, connected to know that it doesn't want to hit pedestrians, that it's, uh, the body itself is soft. And let's, test, let's test some of those principles. Let's test the constitution of those ideas. So we went and we built one. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is, uh, is, I think there was something with the computer, is I'm going to show you uh, one of the examples of what we've been engineering at the MIT Media Lab. This is, this is what we call the zero car. So it's the entire vehicles in the wheel. And Retro, one of the, and one of the group uh, in the Smart Cities group, is here showing it off. Uh, um, oh, there it is. It's spinning on a dime. It drives by wire, which means, excuse me, no mechanical linkages. Right? It's intelligence, connect it's everything. It's essentially a, a smart robot. Right? It's, the car now has zero intelligence, effectively. It'll drive off a cliff and take you with it. So if you put just even the, the intelligence of maybe a, a PDA, right, it could totally change the equation, just so. You could do things like uh, talk to parking meters, negotiate for a parking meter. I need to park there right now, I'm going to pay five bucks. Someone else could say I'm going to pay 20 bucks. But when there's no reason to park, Right, where there's no, no demand for that parking, uh, the parking meter is free. Which would be great on Memorial Day. So, uh, this here is the implications of that in the city itself. And, and this is a sketch of how we, like you saw in that early drawing, connect this to tall buildings or clusters of tall buildings in the city. Uh, no, I don't want the update. <laughs> Uh, unless it can update my research. Uh, okay, so here we are showing this is a vehicle with that same wheel. So there's four of them. You could have three, you can have seven, and you just add volume, add an envelope to the wheel for people, depending on the amount of people in storage, and you have your car. And the, the great thing about it, here's a, uh, we're calling it the Omni Club. This is uh, one of many uh, design iterations that we use. Uh, the fantastic thing is these same wheels can reverse in, in direction and, and move in the Z axes. So they can enter uh, into the building's circulatory core. Uh, here is an, an example of that, just in case you're not imagining it. And here it is fitted into uh, two towers that are later to be a cluster, with the chances between bridging here or the opportunity to put in uh, off-the-shelf wind turbine technology. Um, 
this is this the, the metaphor of all of these things becomes a, 